sure came as a disappointment to, to many of you, either those of you who play uh, winter sports or those of you who are hoping to cover winter sports. I know uh, while that maybe wasn't a huge shock, uh, I'm sure it was still disappointing to you. So I'm really sorry about that. And hopefully uh, it'll be a delay and not a final decision. And, and there will be, uh, we will see basketball, we will see some other sports, but certainly I wanna hear from you guys. I wanna hear, um, you know, what you intend to cover if you're, I assume most of you are in journalism or with school papers. I would ask for a show of hands, but um, you, you might just give me your little hands up thing if I, uh, if you're not on video, so I could see how many of you um, are are with school newspapers. Um, so, you know, I'm talking to you as if you are, as if you're interested in journalism, certainly. Thank you for that. Um, and, and, you know, I'll assume uh, that you're looking for stuff, frankly, to write about and to talk about and to report on uh, not being you know, not having a ton of sports in high school right now. I know there's very little, but that does not in any way mean that there aren't great stories out there. Um, and, and it also doesn't mean, I'm gonna share screen with you and do a little little PowerPoint that I did. Um, it, it also does not mean that there aren't, um, sorry, should start at the beginning, uh, that there aren't tons of sports in the pro ranks because uh, sports <laughs> ironically are in full bloom with the World Series and, and the NFL season. And now, um, you know, the newly crowned NBA and NHL and, and last night, the Dodgers. Um, so I don't know how many of you have heard of this expression, sports equinox, but that was something that happened uh, in early this September. And, and it's an event that's so rare when all four major sports, the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, and the NHL play on the same day that it's it's only happened 19 times uh, before 2020. And it, it usually only occurs in late October, early November, when baseball playoffs run long enough to overlap with the opening days of the NBA season and both line up maybe with a Sunday, Monday, or Thursday NFL game. Um, but last night's Dodgers win uh, game six victory over the Rays to win the World Series was also something really freaky as well with the third champion crowned in a major sport along with the NFL which was I'm sorry the NHL which on September 28th uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning beat the Dallas Stars and then the NBA October 12th when the Lakers beat the Heat uh, that's three major championships three major champions in U.S. sports crowned within one month, which is quite incredible. And, and what it did, which, you know, I wouldn't say that it necessarily saved sports websites, um, but we also had the U.S. Open tennis tournament, we had NASCAR, we had the WNBA playoffs. Um, as sports websites like ESPN um, and The Athletic and, and Bleacher Report, went from really a, a desert to a vast ocean. And like I said, it didn't necessarily save them, but it did, um, it certainly did uh, because, you know, there was a raft of layoffs, unfortunately, over the last several months at Bleach Report. Uh, there's many more expected ESPN, The Athletic had a ton of layoffs, but it, it, it may have saved their, their survival. It may have put off their survival. Let's, let's hope so, because that would be awful uh, if these websites didn't survive. So pro sports did, um, did help us, but what did they look like last spring when uh, stories were obviously like you're facing perhaps in high school, you know, what was going on? We, we were reading about the NBA horse contest and you know, players, announcers doing play-by-play, -play, emptying the dishwasher. Here's some some reminders of stories that we had last spring, which, um, you know, some of them we could laugh at, but some of them were really, really interesting. Um, you know, we watched, we got a chance to we watch past classics, which, you know, we get the chance to, but I don't know that, you know, forced with uh, no other options, it was, uh, not just nostalgic, but I think it really gave us 
kind of uh, maybe younger fans like you guys an appreciation you know, for some other classics that you never got to see. Um, maybe I'll take a little poll later to see how many of you watch, but, but that was really fun, I thought. Um, you know, streaming video games, certainly you're probably well familiar with that. And, but this time we got to watch NBA players competing in video games. So that was something a lot of people uh, a lot of people liked. Um, we, we watched Korean baseball. We watched uh, Taiwanese basketball. We watched professional wrestling with guys like Gronkowski. Uh, we watched uh, The Last Dance, which um, uh, Jay Adande, our, our uh, faculty member, my, my colleague and myself were both a part of that documentary. And that was really fun. Um, and maybe you watched and again maybe you guys at your age you know certainly you've heard of michael jordan but you actually watching that documentary i would think would give you a little better appreciation for a team that probably your parents were were really into um you know the the mock drafts uh the brackets the the weird you know wagers that went on with russian table tennis and uh, you know, some, some odd, you know, competitive marble racing and platform tennis and, you know, all kinds of stuff that, uh, again, you might think are silly. Um, but we also got to listen to athlete podcasts in some really uh, down to earth conversations by athletes that we would not have necessarily, um, you know, been able to see. And, and then, you know, who would forget, I'm sorry, uh, who could forget Roger Goodell in his basement? You know, you never would have seen that, right? Um, if not for this. And, and I'm not saying in any way, I'm not suggesting that, yay, the quarantine was so great uh, in any way. But that was an interesting outlet and an interesting thing for the NFL to do. And I think it was received really well. And again, I'd be curious to see what you guys think. But um, you know, the coaches and the GMs, again, we got a peek behind the scenes, right? Um, we got to see, uh, you know, the, the bubbles, the bubbles everywhere. Um, we, we rediscovered, I think, through the abbreviated uh, NBA and WNBA seasons that, you know, statements that, that professional athletes can make and the influence that they can wield through their very sizable platforms. And uh, maybe we were reminded, you know, we see um, here that uh, uh, the WNBA players dedicated the season to Breonna Taylor. Uh, we saw, you know, they had those t-shirts. They, the NBA had messages, uh, you know, every week, every game with Black Lives Matter, equality, justice, vote with different, um, with different messages. We had these weird, uh, you know, we got to see golf maybe in no you know, real change at all to golf. Uh, appreciate golf for what it was and what it is. Uh, and then the weird cardboard cutoffs, um, cutouts rather. But, you know, we were reminded that, yeah, we miss competitive sports, live competitive sports, no question. Um, but that sports, you know, always have been and, and always will be about the people who play the games. I think that's something that we should remember, certainly. So, so yeah, um, you know, Michael Jordan hitting six three-pointers in the first half of game one of the 92 NBA Finals was huge, right? It was a huge feat. I covered that team. I was the beat writer for the Tribune. And that was something that, uh, that Bulls fans will always remember. But what, what we really remember, what history remembers is not so much that game or that exact achievement, if you ask people uh, about how many three-pointers he had, they wouldn't remember that as much as the shrug, right? Maybe you guys remember or hearing about that. It was his reaction to his six three-pointers um, that got, that, that sort of endured. Um, so yeah, sports is about who wins and loses the games, uh, but it's also about the wild and unpredictable drama that makes it so unique. So yeah, the Chicago Blackhawks winning the Stanley Cup in 2010, the franchise's first in 49 years, was, was big news around here. But how much mileage do we get out of the missing puck on that uh, game-winning 
uh, shot, that Stanley Cup winning shot, this, the puck couldn't be found in the net. Maybe you guys remember. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that we all talked about. What, you know, what do people want from us as sports journalists? Um, you might, you might know this, you might have your own opinion of this. And my opinion is sure they want analysis and they want commentary, they want opinion, but I think they also want to feel like they're with us. They're behind the scenes. And I think sports journalism has gone more and more to that. So, you know, it's, it's Patrick Kane's bedroom uh, in 2007, when he was a rookie with the Blackhawks, I went to Buffalo uh, and went to his parents' house and went inside his bedroom. And the first few graphs of this story is describing this kid's room um, that I described as Forrest Gump, that he had so many brushes with fame um, sitting in his father's lap with, with this hockey great and future Olympian Pat LaFontaine. Um, he was, when he was five or six, um, here, let me, I'm sorry, let me just go to this so I can see it a little better. Um, you know, hockey fans knew that, Blackhawks fans knew is this 18 year old kid who kind of looked like, you know, their neighbor. Um, but what they didn't know was that uh, on the walls of his bedroom, you know, was a picture of uh, him it, when he was a little boy signing the last piece of steel that went into the Buffalo Sabres new arena. Um, that was where he scored his first NHL goal in that very arena. There was a picture of him as a little boy uh, wearing the jersey of then Buffalo Sabres great Dominic Hasek, um, who was a customer of his dad's car dealership. And uh, he recently, when that story was written, he had recently scored a goal in a big victory over Detroit over Hasek. Um, you know, similar went on and on with him. And I, I described his room and, and talked about, you know, where he came from. So those are the kind of stories that I think readers always like going behind the scenes. You know, it's inside the head, inside the helmet uh, of the Bears quarterback in a piece I wrote once about the 40 seconds in between uh, whistles when the, when the, you know, when the play is dead and exactly the countdown of every second and what's going on uh, literally every second in a quarterback's head to give readers, bring them inside the huddle and make them feel like they're there, which is something that you would never get to do. And that's stories that you guys can do. And they don't have to be playing to do something like that, to bring you know, fans inside. It's why we like to see um, pictures you know, of, of players before the NBA playoffs. You see the players get off the bus. What, what, what is that? You know, that? That's not that exciting. They've got their suits on, but you know what? We get to see what they're wearing and we get to see how many of them are listening to music and you know what their facial expressions are. And it's all about um, you know, inside and behind the scenes. It's embedded in the front office. This story I did with the uh, Chicago Tribune, a multi-part series, um, spending almost a year with the people who would begin and, and uh, create the Chicago Sky franchise and everything that went on during that year with them on the road. Um, it's, it's, yes, it is being a sports writer covering you know, dozens of Super Bowls and NBA Finals and NCAA tournaments and, and Olympics. Uh, I covered the Bulls, I covered the Bears. Uh, I worked for, for ESPN um, and I worked for many years for the Tribune and I had a chance to do all of these really cool and really major championships. I covered dozens of Wimbledons and US Opens. I've done every major championship there is, but if you ask me, you know, what, things do you remember, I would say things like this, covering the Special Olympics World Games in Austria a couple years ago and in the Bangladesh female hockey team. Um, you know, this is a team that literally came from a village that had never, uh, they had never left their village, much less been on an airplane to another country. You know, it's a place where their parents had to sign releases for them to play and sign X's on, on the line because they didn't know how to sign their names, many of them. You know, a place where there was no phone and no TV and the internet simply doesn't exist. 
and these kids in Austria uh, winning a gold medal in the Special Olympics. It was, it was incredible and memorable. And just like the Little League World Series I covered when Monet Davis became the first uh, girl to play. Um, you know, it was the story uh, in the Olympics when I covered the U.S. women's water polo team. And it, again, it wasn't so much about the team winning the gold medal. This was in Rio a couple years ago, um, where I didn't write so much about their play as much about their spirit and their reliance and support of a head coach who in the middle of the competition had to go home following the sudden death of his brother. Um, who was a Silicon Valley executive, a very well-known guy, and, and came back during the competition as family's urging. And at the end, the team draping their gold medals around him. It was unbelievable. And those are things I remember. Um, you know, it's about riding in an Uber with Lori Hernandez, who was another Olympian in Rio, a gold medalist, who came home and her life was just forever altered. And I, you know, rode in an Uber with her and and went with her to Dancing with the Stars and uh, learned how, uh, you know, her, her, the lead quote was, you, I wouldn't call myself an average 16 year old. Uh, that said it all and, and how her life was just completely changed. So, you know, good journalism is all about telling good stories, but it's also telling us something we don't know. How many of you know who James Vincent, I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to go see many of you here, but um, somebody speak up, just if Stacy, if you could just let whoever raises their hands, uh, whoever knows who James Vincent Michael Jimmy O'Brien is. How many of you know who that is? Any you can raise your hand. Yeah, use the hand raising or unmute yourself if you know. Anybody know who James Vincent Michael Jimmy O'Brien is? I think you're making that up. <laughs> I think I'm making that up? Okay. <laughs> How about, how about, how, how, how about too many John names. Boy? How many know John Boy? Raise your hands. I bet there's more, right? There's got to be. Oh, there, yeah, there are a couple there. Okay. Well, better known as John Boy, he rose to prominence on the internet in 2019 when he created a viral video showing the subtitles, with subtitles, what New York Yankees manager Aaron Boone appeared to be saying during an argument with an umpire in a game. But he gained further fame when he published a series of videos appearing to demonstrate how a story in The Athletic reported that the Houston Astros were stealing signs in 2017. He's known for his ability to read lips and use video to shed new light on sports topics. Um, he didn't break the Astros story, but he certainly was on top of that. And just the other day, he showed us this little gem, and I'm going to show it to you. Um, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. Uh, you know what? Um, I bet when I sh when I screen shared, I did not. Um, I'm gonna stop share and share again. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. I need to check the boxes. So we'll go back. We'll go back. You can see it, right? Yep. Okay. So you should be able to hear it. I'm gonna go ahead to a. Last night we got one of the wildest. Well, let's um, let's just watch this, and you'll see what John Boy is all about. And here we go. He touches home plate. Phillips sees that. He's over there, bouncing around. He sees this. He sees them chasing him. Throws the helmet up in the air. Goes for a little bird flight around the outfield. Just looks majestic and beautiful. Kiermaier sees him, says, I want to go for a little flight as well. He throws his hands up. Quickly crash lands. Kiermaier's going to fall. He doesn't have it in him to fly around the outfield. Phillips, though, just beautiful. Just beautiful. Majestic. Have yourself a moment. First major league at bat. He runs himself into exhaustion, looks up at the roof in Arlington and says, thank you for answering Adamas's prayers. And then his teammates come over to him, but he can't breathe. And they're trying to celebrate with him. And all he continues to tell them is, I, can, I can't breathe, guys. I can't breathe. Oh, I can't breathe. Yeah! Woo! I can't breathe. Come here, mother. All right? I love that little moment where, where Lau's like, are you all right? 
we're not going to celebrate. And then the camera's just all over him, having a little moment, trying to catch his breath. He actually had to see the trainer before his interview to catch his breath and see if everything was okay. Again, first World Series at bat, only World Series at bat. Puts the ball in play. Chaos ensues. Bad baseball ensues. Beautiful baseball ensues. Phillips is the hero. His interview was awesome. What's up? So, yeah, you know, that's that's John Boy, and that's um, what people love, and this guy is, is wildly popular. And why did they love him? He's not analyzing necessarily any better than uh, – than, than sports, you know, commentators and baseball analysts have been, been around forever. Uh, he could read lips, and he's a guy who started from, from nothing. I don't even know that he majored in journalism. His life story is really pretty incredible um, if you read about him. But he, he really emerged from nowhere and got this incredible thing going, um, you know, just basically reading lips of, of these things, uh, these big moments. So, you know, what is sports going to look like in the future? Maybe, maybe, maybe this, you know, I mean, will it, uh, would follow the lead of, of a lot of, um, a lot of kids your age who follow this 950 plus million dollar industry could be, uh, certainly, um, for me, we'll go back to the old days for a second, uh, covering sports was never really a choice as you see there, um, clearly. I was shooting baskets in a basket when it, the basket was invented, basketball. Uh, but seriously, and I played high school basketball. I, it never seemed to be, I loved journalism. I loved, um, I came up in the era of Watergate. Uh, it was always a romantic kind of proposition for me to, to cover sports. My claim to fame and still is my high school basketball team, Niles West winning the, uh, one of the first Illinois State Girls Championships. And did that influence me? Sure. Um, it made me feel, it made all of us feel uh, in the years post Title IX that absolutely anything was possible. That girls could do anything. Girls could, could own teams and girls could coach professional teams and coach uh, girls could play professional sports. And has it worked out quite that way? Not, not especially, um, but it was a wonderful time for sports and spawned certainly my interest in um, in being a sports writer in the 80s and having really bad hair. Um, and then in the 90s, uh, yeah, you know, this is me uh, with the with the bulls and nice pants on Bill Cartwright. Uh, Dikembe Mutombo at one of those uh, world games that I talked about. Uh, it was kind of fun. Covered lots of Wimbledons there. Um, and in, you know, I was kind of on the edge of of what will be natural for you if you study journalism. And that is that if you're a writer, you better also know how to be on television, how to talk in front of a camera, how to do a radio show or a podcast as well as write. And so, you know, those are some of the things that I was forced into. I wasn't necessarily prepared for, uh, but if you study journalism, you will certainly be prepared for all those things. Um, got to write three books. Uh, uh, when I covered the Bulls, I, I wrote this, this book about Michael Jordan's year away from basketball, which was really interesting to me, one of the most fascinating years uh, of the years I covered the Bulls. And they didn't win. He was playing baseball, but I got to uh, spend time with him in Birmingham playing baseball. Um, and Scottie Pippen, that was the greatest year of his career. So that was really fun. Um, Lou Pinella, that was that you can get it, I think, for about 12 cents on Amazon. Um, but that book was somebody asked me to write it, the publishers, uh, because they had the bright idea in 2008 that the Cubs were going to win the World Series. Um, newsflash, they did not win the World Series. Um, but that book was rolled out anyway um, in time for what would have been the World Series about their manager, Lou Pinella. And then what I just told you about um, my high school basketball team, which has given me the most satisfaction and, and took the longest to write. Uh, this is my Niles West High School team and uh, on the cover. And again, it became really a coming of age story more than a basketball story about uh, this, this generation of girls who had this tremendous opportunity and whose lives were forever changed um, with that. So what do you guys do now? What do you write, right? Let's look at some ideas. Let's talk about them. Um, you know, let me talk to you first and then I'll show you that, uh, 
but uh, you know, if you have questions now, pipe in. I want to talk about different ideas. I've got that link for you to use if you want to. It's some really, really good ideas, uh, some good feature ideas. Uh, if you don't know, you know, what do we do now, right? So how many of you, again, are, um, oh, here, I'll just ask, answer Liam's question. I was just looking for my uh, list of story ideas. Um, so Liam Hubbard says, if my goal is to work in sports journalism, uh, what do I think would be a better plan to attend college with a journalism major with no sports scene or to attend a college with no official major but cover vibrant, vibrant sports as a beat writer for the school paper? Great question. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. That is a great question. Um, I don't think that you could go wrong. Uh, and by no sports scene, you know, you could be describing uh, with no, you know, there are great journalism schools and, and maybe you would have described Medill as one of those places without a vibrant sports scene back in the day. I think we have one now. Is it Duke? Is it North Carolina? Maybe not. Um, so would it be a mistake to go to Medill um, and, and study under Jay Adande and, and, and myself? Absolutely not. I think that uh, going to a great journalism school is never going to hurt you. You're always going to find great stories. And, you know, like I think I just showed you, it doesn't take uh, championship teams to write great stories. You know, it's all about people. And if I could leave you with any real advice, it, it's, you know, you can tell a story about COVID, okay? You can tell a COVID-19 story and you can spew all kinds of really interesting facts and, and percentages. And let's say you're doing a story on unemployment during this terrible pandemic, right? Are you gonna read that story? Or are you gonna read a story that starts out with a lead, with an anecdotal lead about real people that are going through unemployment during the pandemic and who are really suffering, who you could connect with right away? You're gonna read the people story first. You're gonna to get to those statistics in your nut graph. You're gonna to get to them, but you want people stories. And believe me, there are great, great people stories all around you. And it doesn't matter uh, if they're, you know, in the NCAA tournament, if they're winning championships, uh, if they're drawing, uh, you know, 50,000 or, or 20,000. So uh, I would say, you know, you can't go wrong. If you go to a Duke, you're going to be great. You're in North Carolina or team, you know, schools with great sports, but you're also going to compete with a lot of people for covering a huge beat. Um, that's okay. You know, you'll be in the mix. You'll be like uh, one of the pros. Um, just, you know, the key is to get that experience to, to, um, to take good journalism classes, whether they specialize in sports or not, and to just get that really good experience. Um, so, so uh, thanks, Mr. Bozikas, the storytelling. Bozikas, I'm sorry, it's probably Bozikas. Um, what school are you from? Hi, uh, I'm from South Elgin High School, and uh, I teach uh, a broadcast journalism uh, film type of a program. Um, it's an academy that we have here. It's a four-year deal, and uh, and uh, you know we're we're trying to get these kids to to understand that it's all about the storytelling. It's and it's about engaging them and 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 making it, it interesting that you want to keep reading or you want to keep listening or you want to keep watching because. Absolutely. You can't rewind it, uh, you know, and uh, you know, especially with video now, you know, it's it's it, it's such a point and click society that all they, you know, you want you got to keep them engaged or you are going to lose them. Absolutely, and you know, and I have deep faith, or I wouldn't still be teaching journalism. That great storytelling will endure, you know, through absolutely through the clicks and through. Um, you know, the, the fast kind of stuff that you're, you're digesting, that if you see a great story that engages you, that you will stop and you will read it. And, and I know my students do, um, undergrads and graduate students. So, you know, strive to write those because anybody can do that other stuff. How are you gonna rise above the pack, right? Journalism is all about packs. It's all about, you know, Super Bowl media day with thousands of journalists smashed into one podium. Um, how, do you, how do you rise above that? By really outstanding writing. 
you know, by telling us something we don't know. That's what people want. They want to, you know, and that comes from great reporting. Um, re great reporting spawns great writing, uh, but, but those people stories and those great stories are, you know, what you want. Um, so uh, Noor said, I really want to write for college newspaper, but I'm not sure yet if I want to pursue a journalism or a creative writing major. Are there people write for good school newspapers without going after those types of majors? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I'm a journalism teacher. I'm a journalism major in college, uh, but I have graduate students who um, majored undergrad in creative writing and, and they're great writers. And it takes something to, to learn you know, it's not organic chemistry, I always tell them, but to learn how to write journalistically, to learn how to take great amounts of information and boil it down to, to concise and entertaining and informative um, piece of journalism is different than creative writing. I think you can be incredibly creative and be a beautiful writer coming up through journalism. Um, you could learn both ways. Uh, you could take creative writing classes um, and certainly still be in journalism. I'd hate to have you miss the fundamentals of journalism uh, if you're asking for my opinion. Um, so, uh, so, you know, I think you can do both, but uh, if you wanna be a journalist, I would, I would suggest, it's not unheard of, but I would suggest studying journalism. Um, Anna says, my goal is to be a sports broadcaster and I currently write for SI Kids, cool. Um, is there anything now that I can do to help with learning broadcasting tools, in addition to continuing to write, besides trying to shadow a broadcaster once COVID is over. Hmm. Um, so where is Anna? And um, I'd like to ask you what year in school you are. Is Anna, could Anna, yeah, hi Anna. Hello. How are you? So where do you go to school? Um, I live in a really small town in Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. I live near the Poconos. Okay. Actually, so. so you don't have a, a broadcast set up in your high school? No, nothing. Okay. So um, I think, you know, I hate to say what you didn't want me to say about shadowing, because that is probably a really great idea for a high schooler to um, get an internship, you know, might be harder. Um, certainly, if you can, you know, that'd be terrific. But in the, you know, in the meantime, being able to just watch, uh, there's a lot to be said for that. There really is. Um, yeah, it's tough. I mean, and don't limit it to, you know, to TV, uh, you know, try radio. Uh, you know, when you talk about broadcast, there's no reason you can't do your own podcast. There's no reason why you can't start your own website and do uh, webcams and do webcasts rather. Um, you know, you can shoot video and kind of learn on your own and you can, there's all kinds of uh, people you can follow. And, you know, that's the really great thing about you guys in, in the time you're coming up now is you can be published. I'm sure, you know, most of you are, you can write whatever you want. You can, you can you know, start broadcasting tomorrow. Uh, and that's the best experience you could have is, is doing it. So I would, I would start your own website and, and just experiment and have fun with it and try to shoot some video and see what happens. Okay. Um, Peyton said, sometimes stories can become boring and how do you try and keep your writing exciting, interesting? Great story, great, great um, question. You know, I tell my students, I just told them this morning, actually, if you read your story and you're like, oh, this is kind of boring, it will be boring to readers. It's not going to transform itself, okay? And there is no shortcut to that. If you ask some of our great sports writers in our country of all time, Gary Smith from Sports Illustrated, if you ask uh, 100 sports writers who their favorite sports writers are and who are some of the best, Gary Smith would be on every single list, right? If you ask Gary Smith, what do you do? How are you so great? How did you become such a great writer? He'd go, ah, I'm not that great of a writer. I'm a good reporter. 
that's what it's all about, right? It's about if your teacher says, okay, for this assignment, you have to interview at least two people, at least three people. It's interviewing six people, eight people, 10 people, because that's the only way to get good stuff, you know, to really, really observe, to really describe. And, you know, you're in a situation now where you're like, well, how am I going to do that? I'm on the phone, I'm on Zoom. You know, that's kind of hard. I'm not watching games, okay? Well, that's where you will become a better reporter. And I'm convinced of this. You will have to ask better questions. You will have to ask questions that get your subjects to describe the scene, okay? So if you ask them, what was the greatest moment of your career? What, you know, what did you do last year, your junior year that you remember better than anything? And they tell you, now you get to a show, don't tell, right? Tell me exactly, tell me exactly what you did that day. What do you remember the first thing you did that day, the first thing you did that game? And you pepper them with questions. You tell them, look, I'm gonna get you to recreate this scene, but I'm gonna to have to ask you a lot of questions. They're gonna seem kind of dumb. They're gonna seem kind of overly detailed, but I need you to really remember and really, really tell me. I'm gonna need you to take your, your camera and videotape your bedroom so I can show my readers you know, what your room looks like. Or, oh, you work out in the basement? Okay, take your camera down there, take your phone and shoot some video. And I'm gonna use that video. And that's something we didn't do before, before the pandemic. We didn't think of doing stuff like that. Let's do a podcast with the other athletes in school. Let's start creating stuff um, that you know, wasn't there before. Uh, there's fascinating stories. And the thing is too, you guys are super lucky because you are, you know, you are fellow students with these athletes. No one knows what you know. No one's sitting in class. I'm not sitting in class with them. Uh, you know, I could have 30 years experience on you, but you're the ones who are hearing the stuff in the hallways. You're, you're, you know, you're on Zoom with them. You remember, you know, your friendships with friends of friends last year, you know what's going on, you hear stuff, act on that. Um, you know, when I was in college, I, I covered, uh, I went to University of Iowa and Lou Olson was the coach back then. He just passed away, he was longtime coach at University of Arizona and he was longtime coach at Iowa. And he kind of made this decision to leave Iowa and go to Arizona to be their basketball coach, kind of in the middle of the night, it was almost, this secretive kind of thing that he was sneaking off. He was packing up late at night, his office. There was little rumors flying around. And here's me at the Daily Iowan, right? I'm on campus, I'm on the school paper. I'm thinking, well, how can I compete with the Des Moines Register and the Cedar Rapids Gazette and the Chicago Sun-Times? And suddenly I realized I, I could compete because I'm on campus and I run across the bridge over the river and I go to the office, to, to Lou Dolson's office, and there he is carrying a box out to his car, literally catching him sort of in mid departure. And he says, hey, you know what? Yeah, talk to me, sit in my car. And that was my first big story. I sat in his car and talked to him because I was a kid on campus. You know, I beat the Des Moines Register and I beat the Cedar Rapids Gazette and I called it into the Chicago Sun-Times and that was my first big break. You're in school with them. You know what's up. You know what are really cool stories. Um, I'm going to show you some ideas too. Uh, Mr. Bozikas, I appreciate it. You say, what challenges have you overcome? Absolutely. That's the best question. What obstacles have you overcome? We'll always get them to think. We'll always get them to answer good questions. You guys, I'm sure all know, don't ask yes, no. Ask questions that start with those five W's, who, what, where, when, why. You're going to get better answers. What are the biggest obstacles you faced? You're gonna get some answers and, and give them some time, right? Ask them good questions and give them time to answer. Uh, when you interview someone, you know how it feels, right? You have that awkward silence when they haven't, they're thinking or they're just, they answer short and they don't give a good answer. Let them have that awkward silence. Let it sit there the next time you ask a question. Let it sit there five to 10 seconds. They'll fill it. You're going to want to fill it because that's how people are. They want to fill that awkward silence. Let them talk and you'll see. Um, let's look at some, some uh, story ideas. We have till the hour, right, Stacey? Okay. 
Um, so we'll look at some, uh, some story ideas. There's a ton of them and you could use this link. Um, and here's some, these are high school journalism ideas, right? So, you know, conditioning during the off season, uh, you know, this is especially good. What are they doing? Um, and, and more than that is, is how are they keeping team unity? I'm sure you've thought of that, but, but really get into it. Not just, oh, we talk to each other a lot and, and we're, we're really good friends, but exactly what do they do? Have one of them write a diary. Um, you know, not just talk, don't just talk to the stars. And I know right now they're not playing, but talk to the last guy on the bench. Cause you know what, he's going to be observing uh, everybody. He's usually has the best things to say. Uh, there are stories in a kid in high school nowadays, who's willing to put in all the work and not play a lot. There's a lot to be said for those, for those kids. What are referees doing, trainers doing, um, you know, the Illinois High School Association has been put in a real awkward position now. You could, you could get into a little bit more of what they do. Um, you know, why, uh, you know, why is one sport all, always seemingly successful and others aren't, right? Um, you know, why do some girl sports always do better than the boys? Uh, relationships among athletes. Uh, some extreme sports you may have in your school. Uh, I know dance is being, is, they're allowing dance in Illinois, right? They're not letting uh, basketball, but dance is uh, socially distanced. Um, and how many of you have ever written about dance? Probably not, but it's a sport, you know? It can be a sport, absolutely, like competitive cheerleading. Do some of those stories that you wouldn't have done before. Um, you know, uh, sudden growth in popularity or the decline in interest in a particular sport. D dig into that. Uh, you know, this gives you the opportunity while they're not playing to really dig into some good stories. Um, you know, coaches' spouses are, are interesting. Uh, you wouldn't think, you know, you think of pro and college uh, wives and husbands and what they go through, but you don't think about high schools, but boy, that's, it's an interesting life. And that, those are, those are good stories and they're usually really happy to talk to you. Uh, the rising costs of high school sports, always a good story. Um, you know, drugs and alcohol and tobacco, you know, what's going on with that? Uh, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the rules haven't changed, but, but you know, yeah, you could look at this in all different ways. I was just trying to think of what word I'm trying to think of. Um, E-cigarettes, that's what I was trying to think of. You know, what's going on with those? Uh, with COVID, it seems like maybe, and you know, the, the importance of keeping your lungs healthy. I don't know if people are, are not smoking e-cigarettes as much, but certainly that's always a story in, in, among high school kids. Athletic trainers, you know, coaches and parents. I think this is a great, great story. Um, did the time off, has that made parents who are, really rabid for lack of a better word, more rabid and a little more crazy? Or is it giving them some perspective that, you know what, maybe sports isn't everything. Maybe, um, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, this gave us some more time as a family. Um, maybe, maybe playing a hundred games a year, you know, isn't so healthy physically or mentally. I think that's a great, great story. Um, history of your school's teams, there's always an anniversary, you know, look into that. It could be 50 years since the last championship or since a team won, uh, you know, 20 games in a row or, you know, there's all kinds of stuff. Take this time to pour through those archives and, and look at cool stuff like that. Um, I'll go back and see if there's any more questions, but those are some, some ideas. Um, uh, yeah, no more questions, but uh, we can keep asking, you know, we could keep talking about ideas, but how many of you are actually working on sports staffs of your college paper, or I'm sorry, of your high school papers? So there's still, so um, uh, Reagan, tell me, are they still having a sports section? in your paper? Um, 
Yeah, I live in Bullies. It's we're in a small town in Kentucky, but we have our own magazine, The Wildfire, and we all kind of we cover each sport, and we've kept that up. At my school, we've kept sports up through all the shutdowns. I really just try to have restrictions on it to keep people safe from COVID, but we're still covering it, and we have each sections. How many? Um, oh, so Anna, I'm looking. You can't have a newspaper this year. That's or you don't really. Um, so you can't have any clubs, you know, you guys can still uh, do a newsletter, you know, why can't you put out your own newsletter, if you're really, you know, itching to write and report, you know, newsletters are the biggest things right now, and you can certainly start one. Um, uh, I see Liam, you said you're publishing articles, that's terrific. What about some of the, are there some GBN people here? I know there are. Somebody... I, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a shout out to my kids, uh, former high school. Um, so somebody from Glenbrook North, uh, tell me what stories you've been doing, because I know you're doing some good stuff. I'm going to let that awkward silence go, because I know you're out there. I don't recognize names, but somebody from Glenbrook North, come on, don't embarrass me. <laughs> Now I put the pressure on. Missy, no kids here today. They're coming. Oh, they're they've not. Got the oh, okay. They're All in right. class. They're, uh, they've got the, uh, they're getting the recorded link to the session. Okay. So that they can come in. Okay. Thanks for speaking up for them because I was going to shame them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have I mean, them send you their responses. Do you have a second though, Brian, to tell yeah. us like what stories they might have been working on or might be thinking about? Yeah. The, the timing's tough. They're coming in tonight, so I'm going to see what they've got going for this next issue. So I'll see those tonight. Um, but it, it's been challenging, the IHSA stuff, certainly. Um, last month, they did a story on the cross country, cross country team's challenges with the COVID restrictions and what it's like to run in a meet in COVID versus running in a meet during normal times and all of the, the, you know, the, the you know, not hearing a runner breathing right next to you and not hearing the, the fans and your parents screaming for you from the sidelines. So they're just trying to show how COVID has affected those experiences. Are, they, are there any sports right now going on at, at Glenbrook North? The, um, the fall sports that were going on are uh, just finished. They had tennis and swimming and golf. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, winter is completely up in the air. Right, right. Um, thanks for that. I didn't mean to put you on the spot and, and put all of GBN on the spot there, but um, <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, is there anyone else who has written some cool offbeat stories that maybe you want to share with everybody? Uh, you know, we're talking about kind of what can you do during this time? We go back to that list, but what other stories, or if you're just thinking of things now, um, you know, that, that maybe you hadn't thought of before that you might be able to do. And you could just, you can just pipe in on mute. Um, over the summer, uh, when like everything was shut down, I was able to like start my own sports blog and podcast about uh, mainly MLB and like NFL topics. And I've kept that going during the school year. Yeah. So... <laughs> Since those are still going on, it's like a good opportunity to uh, write about that since school sports are limited. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that uh, a lot of um, my colleagues will, will say, sports reporters will talk about, all reporters, is that one, your, your sources, your subjects, these athletes are, are less busy. You know, they're, they're home. Uh, not doing anything really because they would have been playing sports and you would have had a harder time nailing them down. So now you've got them available and you also have this incredible bond that wasn't there before that um, sports writers and pro athletes suddenly are going through the exact same experience. You know, you're, you, they might be missing out on, on their uh, basketball season, but you're missing out on your newspaper, you know, and you're missing out on whatever else, you're both missing out on perhaps school, maybe you're remote, um, maybe you're trying to get through hybrid, 
uh, you've got these really, you know, these, these common uh, experiences that you may not have ever had before. And it really helps striking that common ground anytime you talk to an interview subject to try to get that rapport with people. Well, you can get something right now that you will never have gotten. Um, and the other thing I would say when you talk about, um, oh, that's cool, Tawny. Tawny said, uh, you know, how the marching band has figured out how to play wearing masks. I'd love to see that. A trumpet player with a mask is unbelievable. That's a great story. Um, and uh, Brody, you said, how would you cover sports? We're the only sports journalism there and you have, uh, journalists, you have to do everything. Well, that does sound really um, overwhelming in some ways, but it's what a lot of people do. You know, the first job out of college, many people are going to small papers and small websites and small stu uh, television studios, television stations rather, and, and doing it all. They've got the camera, they're shooting, they're editing, uh, maybe they're, they're tweeting, they're writing on their websites. So anything that you do now, if you wanna be a professional, that's great training. That's wonderful training. Um, that's what we do now, you know. Uh, even at uh, you know the last few years working for ESPN, I was taking photos. I was never doing that before. I was constantly live tweeting. I was taking video. Uh, you won't talk to a journalist now, even from the largest uh, outlet, who doesn't do their own, uh, you know, who doesn't uh, take their own photos sometimes and take their own video and and tweet and and all of that stuff. So. What you're doing is not all that unusual. It's not all that different from what we're all doing right now. Um, any other thoughts about what you can do? Uh, again, you guys, you know, you're in a time right now. Uh, again, I tell my students, you know, it's heartbreaking. And I and believe me, I feel for you so much that you have to go through this in maybe your whatever year in high school you are, but you know, particularly seniors, uh, you're trying to enjoy your senior year. I know it's gotta be painful, uh, but this opportunity as a journalist is unlike anything. And when we are trained and we tend to look at things as terrible as they could be as great opportunities for storytelling and great reporting chances. And so, Years and years from now, um, your kids and your grandkids are going to want to know what it was like. And, and if you don't remember and you don't have any written documentation for it, you're going to be sorry. And so even if it's just a journal, just jot stuff down, you know, even if it's not a big website, write what you're feeling, write details, what you're experiencing, because it will be gold. I'm telling you, it will be absolute gold. Uh, years from now, if you can say what it was like my senior year in high school during a pandemic. Are you kidding? You'll be best seller selling authors and you'll want to thank me, but I'll be dead. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you want to thank me anyway. I'll know. So um, so to do that, take, try to look at this opportunity as a, as a chance to tell to tell wonderful stories and and to get to be better journalists, and even if you're not going to be a journalist, believe me, it's really going to help you uh, to be a good writer, you know, to be able to express your thoughts is something that will serve you well throughout college, no matter what, and almost in any profession uh, that you're in, uh, to be able to edit your thoughts and to express yourself and to be expressive and, and concise and, and uh, informative is a tremendous, tremendous tool, tools to have. So, um, yeah, any, any other last thoughts or anybody from my I, alma mater out there, Niles West, sorry, Stace, anybody from Niles West? No? Doesn't look like it. All the locals are ditching me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, I wanted to also say that I didn't mention earlier, if you are interested in the Northwestern Medill undergraduate program, I did put a link to our website in there. And one of the things we often tell our prospective students that if you're not sure if you want to do specifically journalism, you like writing, but you're not sure yet, we our students don't always become journalists. They what they become, as Missy said, are tremendous storytellers. 
they learn what it means to be thirsty for knowledge. They go after those stories. They, they learn how to tell the story in the engaging way. And then they often go on to careers in every walk of life. But you'll, you know, having the quality, the ability to express yourself translates to everything you do in the rest of your life. And so it can be just a really great foundational major. Um, and, and, you know, it can take you lots of different directions. So um, I just wanted to wrap up quickly. I'm excited to announce that Brody Kurtzinger, for, forgive me if I don't pronounce that correctly, is the winner of our baseball hat today. And I believe Brody is from Washington, Kentucky. So thanks for being on here today. And we have one more program left, which is tomorrow. It's not too late to register for that. And that's going to be our faculty member, Arianne Nettles, who's going to be doing social media, um, a program on social media. So that'll be terrific, too. So I want to thank uh, Melissa Isaacson today for all of her words of wisdom. And uh, I hope you guys all stay safe and continue to tell great stories. ACA, um, one quick thing. Yes. I put the link to the uh, feature ideas uh, in the chat um great so also that link you can you can grab Let's perfect a things up yeah thank you thank terrific. you terrific so and you guys will get a recording of this session automatically once we get the captioning added to it it takes a couple days for us to do that but we'll be posting it and i will directly email you a copy of the recording so thanks so much for being here thanks again melissa and thank we'll see y'all later thanks everyone bye appreciate it <laughs>